Thank you so much to the Prime Minister's Office for having me here, and thank you all for being here as well. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to be here with you and to be part of this extremely important and exciting conversation about the role of happiness in our society and in our lives. I imagine that most of us are here because we agree that there is something beyond money that motivates people and that makes life worth living, that there's something beyond money and economic prosperity that we should be shaping our institutions and our societies in the image of, and that thing being happiness. And as much as I think that this new emphasis and shift towards happiness is exciting and accurately reflects what people actually care about, I also want to argue today that there is something even beyond happiness that we should be thinking about in our own lives to pursue and that we should be shaping our institutions in favor of pursuing as well. So of course, happiness gets a lot of press um, today. In, in, in the West especially, Western media, we're constantly being led to believe that a good life is a happy life and that we should pursue happiness and that if we pursue happiness, we'll be more successful, have more friends, be more attractive, make more money, all of these benefits that come with happiness. Happiness, we think, is the be all and end all of life. But what exactly makes us happy? So several years ago, I became increasingly obsessed and interested in this question, and it led me to studying positive psychology in graduate school, which is a field that we've been hearing a lot about today. Of course, positive psychology, for those who might not know, is the study of the good life and well-being using the empirical methods of the social sciences. And when I was in graduate school for positive psychology, I learned some things that really surprised me. One of the things I learned was that when we value happiness and emphasize it in our lives the way that our Western media and culture encourages us to do, and as Dr. Lubomirsky was talking about, we can actually end up feeling unhappy as a result. But that wasn't all. The other thing that really got me was the following paradox. So objectively speaking, the world is getting better by nearly every conceivable measure. Rates of violence are down. You're far less likely today to die from disease and illness than you were in decades past. Rates of literacy are going up. Poverty, year by year. Some people say that extreme poverty will be eliminated in our lifetimes. It's, it's gotten so much better. So by nearly every conceivable measure, these objective criteria of suffering are being almost eliminated from our lives and our world. And yet, at the same time, more people feel hopeless, depressed, and alone. For decades now, rates of depression, anxiety, loneliness, nearly every mental illness indicator that I could find have been rising. And the same is true with the suicide rates. In the United States, the suicide rate recently reached a 30-year high, and it's been rising in countries around the world as well. There's this emptiness, I think, that's gnawing away at people, and you don't even have to be clinically depressed to feel it. I think that sooner or later, we all wonder, is this all there is? And according to the research, what predicts this growing, rising tide of despair is not a lack of happiness. It's a lack of something else. It's a lack of having meaning in life. Meaning, meaningfulness. Many people use the terms happiness and meaning interchangeably, but they're actually different. So happiness, according to many psychologists and philosophers, is a positive mental and emotional state. It's a state of comfort and ease and enjoyment. If you feel good, you're happy. If you feel bad, you're unhappy. And that's how I think most ordinary people use the term in their day-to-day -day lives. It's certainly how the media uses it. Happiness is that big, yellow, smiley face. Meaning, though, is bigger. For as long as human beings have existed, they've yearned to know what makes their lives meaningful. 
The first great work of literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh, 4,000 years old, is all about a hero's journey to understand what makes his life worth living, given the fact that he will die. And in the centuries since his story has been told, that quest has become more urgent than ever. The rise of art, of literature, of philosophy, of science, the centrality of religion and spirituality to our lives, all of these, I would argue, are, are, are a manifestation of our yearning to know the answer to the following two questions. What is the meaning of life? And how can I lead a meaningful life? Now, the term meaning is famously, infamously, you could say, vague. So I hope that I can bring a little bit of clarity to it um, in the following few minutes. So psychologists say that a meaningful life is, comes from connecting and contributing to something beyond yourself. And we know from the work of the researcher Michael Steger that when people say their lives are meaningful, it's because three conditions have been satisfied. The first is that they believe their lives have significance and worth. In other words, they believe their lives matter. The second is that they believe their lives have a sense of purpose. So there's some goal or aim that drives them. And finally, they believe their lives are coherent, which means that they don't conceive of their experiences as random and disconnected, but they see them as part of a greater, larger whole, and that their lives make sense to them, and that life in general makes sense to them. I know that sometimes, in, this is true of, of me, certainly, and, and perhaps of some of you, that we can get really preoccupied with happiness. But the research, this new and growing body of research around meaningfulness shows that finding meaning in life is actually the more fulfilling path. So people who have meaning in life are more resilient in the face of adversity. They do better at work and at school. They um, take better care of themselves. When they're approaching the end of their lives, they're far less terrified by the prospect of death. And in general, they feel a sense of contentment and peacefulness when they think about their lives and whether they have made something of them. So all of this made me wonder, what can we do to lead more meaningful lives? It used to be that things like religion, spirituality, family, allegiance to a country, community, traditions, that these were all default paths to meaning that we could all kind of fall into. But increasingly, especially in the developed world, those traditional sources of meaning are receding both from public life and from individual private lives. Fewer people are having children. Fewer people identify as religious. The idea that you would uh, you know, serve your country or be patriotic towards it is in increasingly dismissed as a chauvinistic conceit. And so given all of that, I think the existential question of today is how do people find meaning in the modern world? And to find out, I spent five years interviewing as many people as I could, over 100 people across the world, and reading through thousands of pages of psychology research, neuroscience, philosophy, literature, history, anything that I could get my hands on. And as I did that, and as I sifted through the research and the data and listened to what people told me, I started noticing certain patterns and themes come up again and again. And these are what I call the four pillars of a meaningful life. And they are belonging, purpose, storytelling, and transcendence. So I'll go through each of them and give an example to, to help illustrate what these are all about. So we all know that relationships are important for well-being, but belonging is really about being in a specific kind of relationship, one where you're valued for who you are intrinsically and where you value others as well. And I think that's really important to understand because so many of the relationships that people are in, so many of the groups that we belong to, deliver a cheap form of belonging. You're valued for what you're willing to do, what you achieve, uh, who you know, who you hate, 
and not for who you are inside. True belonging springs from love and it lives in moments between individuals and it's a choice. We can each choose to cultivate belonging with others. Let me give you an example. So my friend Jonathan lives in New York City and um, how many people have been to New York? So if you've been to New York, then you know that it's a busy, crazy city where the people can be grumpy a lot of the times because they're always running late. And so in the midst of that, every morning, Jonathan goes and he buys a newspaper from the same street vendor on this corner in New York, on the street corner in New York. And even though they have every incentive to rush through this exchange of goods for money, they both take a second to slow down and treat each other as human beings. They ask each other how they're doing over the years. They've come to know about each other's families, each other's children, each other's kids. And they both end up leaving the interaction feeling elevated. They're not just conducting a transaction. They're having a real human connection. Well, one time, Jonathan went to go buy a newspaper, but he didn't have the right change. And the vendor said, don't worry about it. This time, it's on me. But Jonathan insisted on paying. So he went to a store, and he bought something that he didn't need to make change. But when he gave the money to the vendor, the vendor drew back. He was hurt. He was trying to do something kind for Jonathan, and Jonathan rejected his bid for intimacy and friendship. I don't know about you, but I, I think we all do things like that all the time, whether we realize it or not. I know I do. I, you know, I'll check my phone when someone's talking to me. I'll walk by someone and barely acknowledge them. And these acts, they devalue others. They make them feel invisible and unworthy. When you, you know, bring people into a research lab and you make them feel ostracized and rejected, they literally not only rate their lives as less meaningful, but they rate life in general as less meaningful. But when you lead with love, you create this bond of belonging that lifts each of you up. So for many people, belonging is going to be the most important source of meaning, those bonds that you have to family and friends. But for others, the key to meaning is the second pillar, which is purpose. So I mentioned purpose earlier, and I'll dive a little bit more deeply into it now. Purpose is, you know, a lot of people sit, you know, think about purpose, they think about finding a job that makes them happy. But purpose is less about doing things that make you happy than it is about giving to the world in some way. So psychologists define purpose as an aim or a goal that organizes your life and motivates you and involves making a contribution to others. And it can come in all shapes and sizes. So I spoke to a doctor who was a researcher and he told me that his purpose is working on a cure to cancer. I also spoke to a hospital cleaner and she told me that her purpose isn't cleaning bedpans and mopping the floor, it's helping sick people get better. Many parents tell me that their purpose is raising their children. Purpose comes from using, taking the best within you, your strengths, and using them to give back in some way. Now, for many of us, as Paul DeLon mentioned in his talk, that happens through the work that we do. That's how we contribute, and that's how we feel needed. That's what gives us a role to play in society. But that also means that issues like disengagement at work, unemployment, low labor force participation, so people who are unemployed and not looking for work because they've given up, these aren't just economic problems, they're existential ones as well. Without something worthwhile to do, people flounder. And indeed, there is a growing body of research that shows that lacking purpose is actually a hazard for our health. So people who have purpose, they have better cardiovascular health, they have better mental health, uh, brain health, I mean. They, um, they're more likely to use preventative uh, medical services, and they even live longer. And that's because purpose gives you something to live for. It gives you some why that drives you forward. So purpose and belonging. The third pillar of meaning is also about getting outside of yourself, but in a completely different way, transcendence. 
So transcendent states are those rare moments when you're lifted above the hustle and bustle of daily life and you feel connected to a higher, some might even say sacred reality. And these experiences, like purpose, also come in different shapes and sizes. So for many people, transcendence is something that you experience in a religious or spiritual context, through prayer, through meditation, going to church, temple, or mosque. For others, it's something that you experience in nature, looking up at the stars at night, contemplating your own smallness and insignificance in the grand scheme of things or listening to really beautiful music, or going to an art museum and just staring at something that's beautiful that gets you outside of your own head for a few minutes. And people who've had transcendent experiences rate them as among the most profoundly meaningful experiences of their lives. And the reason is that these experiences can change you in significant ways. So one of the things that they do is they shift your perspective. So you're looking up at the stars at night, you're praying, you're meditating, and all of a sudden you feel your own smallness in the presence of something much bigger. And what that does is it makes not only you feel smaller, it makes your problems and your anxieties, all the things that you worry about and you think are important feel smaller, and it puts you in touch with what actually matters. And the other thing that it does is that even though it makes you feel smaller, which can be a terrifying feeling, it also makes you realize that you're connected to something much bigger, and that can be wonderfully reassuring to people. I think a really nice illustration of transcendence uh, comes via this study that was done several years ago in California, a, a beautiful place in the world. And what the researchers did was they had students look up at a towering grove of 200 feet tall eucalyptus trees, just for one minute. But that minute, that single minute of transcendence and awe transformed them. Later on in the study, when they were manipulated to be placed in a situation where they could help somebody, they were much more likely to be generous and helpful with their time than people who were in a control condition. So belonging, purpose, and transcendence. The final pillar of meaning, the fourth pillar, is storytelling. And this is the story that you tell yourself about yourself, about how you became the person that you are today. Crafting a narrative around the events of your life brings clarity. It helps you understand how you became you. But I think the reason why this pillar can sometimes surprise people is because we don't always realize that we're the authors of our own stories and can change the way we're telling them. Our lives aren't just a list of events. It's not like I was, you know, this happened and that happened and now here I am. We're always and constantly making narrative choices about the stories that we tell about who we are. And we can edit those stories and interpret them and retell them in more positive and empowering ways even as we're constrained by the facts. So let me give you an example. Several years ago, I met a young man named Emeka, who was paralyzed playing football in the United States for a semi-professional football team. After his injury, Emeka told himself the following story about his life. He said, you know, before I was playing football, I was a screw up. My parents were always on my case. I couldn't do anything right. But then when I started playing football, things came together for me. I, I became really successful. I became popular. I was the life of the party, and everyone liked me. But then, after my injury, my, my life is over. I'll never be able to do the things I'll, I want to do. I, how, how am I going to be able to find a job? Who is going to want to marry me like this? Will I ever have children? People who tell stories like that, which, are, which psychologists call contamination stories, stories that move from good things happening to bad things happening, they tend to be more anxious and depressed and be, believe that their lives are less meaningful. And that certainly was Emeka for a while. But with time and reflection, he started to weave a different story. The new story that he told himself went like this. He said, you know, before my injury, I was a pretty selfish guy. I partied a lot, I didn't really help out my family or my friends, and didn't care about anybody except myself, didn't care about how my teammates were doing, just cared about me. But my injury made me realize that, that, that I could be a better man, that that's not the only version of myself that exists within me, that I can do things to become better. 
And that edit to his story changed Emeka's life. After he told that new story to himself, he found the motivation to start mentoring kids in his community. And he eventually got a college degree in counseling so he could continue helping other people. That new story is what the psychologist Dan McAdams would call a redemptive story, a story that moves from good things, excuse me, from bad things happening to good things happening. So my life was, I thought, ruined by this injury, but actually it changed me for the better. McAdams, who is a psychologist at Northwestern University, has studied the types of stories that people tell about their lives for decades now. And what he's found is that people who tell People who are leading meaningful lives tell stories about their lives that are defined by redemption, by growth, and by love. But how can we change the story that we're telling if we're not telling a particularly helpful one and healthy one? Well, a lot of people turn to psych psychologists and psychotherapy to professional help to get someone to uh, help them edit and rewrite their stories. But we can all do this on our own as well. We don't have to necessarily go see a shrink to do it. All we have to do is reflect on our lives in a thoughtful manner. Think about what the significant experiences of our lives were, the high points, the low points, what we gained from them, what we lost, how they shaped us. That's what Emeka did. But it's not gonna, we're not gonna change our story overnight. It could take years and it's often a very painful process because sometimes the experiences that shape us most profoundly are experiences of suffering, loss, and grief. But by embracing those experiences, we can end up with new wisdom and new insights about how our life unfolded and we can find eventually the good that sustains us, that redemptive quality. So belonging, purpose, transcendence, and storytelling. These are the four pillars of meaning. When I was younger, I was lucky enough to be surrounded by all of the pillars. Growing up, my parents ran a Sufi meeting house out of our home in downtown Montreal. Sufism is a school of mysticism that's associated with Islam and the poet Rumi and the whirling dervishes. And living in the Sufi house meant that twice a week, spiritual seekers, Sufis, would come over to our home and meditate for several hours. They would drink Persian tea from little uh, clear glasses, and they would gather and tell stories about the lives of medieval Sufi saints and sages. Their practice involved serving all of creation through small acts of love. And that wasn't as easy as it sounds because it meant being kind when you didn't like somebody, it meant being kind when people offended and hurt you. But it gave them a purpose to rein in their ego. Eventually, I left home and I went to college and without that daily grounding of Sufism in my life, I felt unmoored and I began to wonder what it is that makes our lives worth living. And that's what set me on this journey. Looking back, I now realize that the Sufi house had a real culture of meaning, that the pillars were part of the architecture and the presence of the pillars helped us all live more deeply. But the same principle works in other strong communities as well, good ones, and bad ones. Gangs, cults, groups like ISIS, these are cultures of meaning that give people something to live and die for. But that's exactly why we as a society, as leaders, as parents, as educators, need to do everything that we can to offer people better alternatives and to shape these institutions with the pillars to help them become their best selves. But living a meaningful life takes work, and it's an ongoing process. As each day goes by, we're constantly adding to our lives and creating a new piece of our story. And sometimes, we can get off track. Whenever that happens to me, I think of a powerful experience I had and a conversation that I had with my father. So several months after I graduated from college, my father had a heart attack that nearly killed him. 
And when I asked him what was going through his mind as he faced death, he told me that all he could think about was needing to live so that he could be there for my brother and me. And that's what gave him the will to fight for life. When he went under surgery, when he went, excuse me, uh, under anesthesia for emergency surgery, instead of counting backwards from 10 like the doctors told him to do, he started repeating our names in his mind like a mantra. He wanted our names to be the last words he spoke on earth if he died. Now my dad is a carpenter and a Sufi. It's a humble life, but a good life. Lying there facing death, he had a reason to live love. His sense of belonging within his family, his purpose as a dad, his transcendent meditation repeating our names. These, he says, are the reasons why he survived. That's the story he tells himself. And that's the power of meaning. Happiness is wonderful, but it comes and goes. But when life is really good and when things are bad, having meaning gives you something to hold on to. Thank you.